Hi everyone, I'd like to really warmly welcome you to today's Limerick FameLab event. As you might know, FameLab is a global science communication competition run by ourselves and British Council across the world with our partners in Cheltenham Science Festival. Of course, many of you will know that it's a slightly bittersweet moment for FameLab too, as the cycle of competitions ends this year. But we look forward to working with our alumni and our partners on new ways to work together in years to come. Speaking of partners, I want to say a special thanks to our funders, Science Foundation Ireland, and our sponsors, CPL and Henkel. I also want to say a massive thank you to University of Limerick and Newstalk, as well as all our other regional partners. I hope you really enjoy today's event. Good luck to all the participants and good luck to everybody who's rooting for them as well. Let's go to our host. Thanks so much. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ita Richardson from the University of Limerick and Lero, the Science Foundation Ireland Research Centre for Software. So it's time to welcome everybody to another year of FameLab in Limerick. And we're delighted to be part of the world's largest science communication competition, which Mags has already mentioned. It has been running in Ireland for nine years and in Limerick for many of those years, hosted by the University of Limerick. So I want to welcome everyone here this evening, for you, our audience, who have given up your time to come in and to support your colleagues and friends and the scientists from the University of Limerick in their talks this evening. It is really great to see you here and particular welcome to those of you who haven't attended one of these events before this. So the format of the event is that each contestant has three minutes to explain any aspect of science to a non-scientific audience. They're judged on three particular things, on content, that what they're presenting is scientifically sound, on clarity, that they clearly explain what they are talking about, and charisma. And I suppose that could be described as leaving us with the feeling, I'd like to hear more about that. They're not allowed to use PowerPoint. It is only just the contestant and the props that they can fit on the screen. Of course, this year we have a virtual event, so it is a little bit different than normal years, but I'm sure they are going to give us a great evening's entertainment. We also encourage you to engage on Facebook feed and on Twitter. So that's at famelab underscore Ireland or hashtag FameLab as we go through the evening. Because again, it's important that our science engineering technology is actually distributed to a wider audience. So this evening, we've got three judges with us. No competition would be complete without the good judges. So the first person on my list is Dr. Ronan O'Higgins, who's a senior lecturer in solid mechanics and composites and he's also the course director of the integrated BE and ME of Aeronautical Engineering in the School of Engineering. Ronan has a PhD in composite aircraft structures and has 15 years experience as a composite researcher. So through his teaching and research, he regularly interacts with industry nationally and internationally. He has received the Collier Research Hypersizer American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Structures Best Paper Award at SciTech 2018. He has also received the University of Limerick's President's Staff Excellence Award for Leadership. He's used to being a judge. He's been a judge at the Irish Aviation Awards 2016 and 2019, and is also a technical assessor for the Irish National Accreditation Board. Ronan is an advocate for STEM communication and outreach, and so we welcome Ronan this evening. Thank you, Ronan, for coming along. Second judge is Mary Fnuken, who is faculty manager at the Kemi Business School of the University of Limerick. Mary's background is in business studies. She has a degree in business studies where she has specialized in human resource management, and she has an MEd in training and development. She's been on the University Governing Authority and many of its subcommittees. 
She's also a member of the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, the Irish Institute of Training and Development, UL's Health and Safety Committee, and UL's organisation, Culture Working Group. Mary is well known to many of the UL alumni because she was Chief Marshal of Ceremonies at UL for over 20 years. And she tells us that among her memorable moments in UL are when she led the team responsible for preparing and welcoming President Bill Clinton on campus. And she also led the team on the occasion of the official state visit to UL of the President of the European Commission at that time, President Jose Manuel Barroso. So welcome to Mary. Thank you again for coming along this evening. And our third judge, is Dr. David Corcoran. So David has been head of the Department of Physics and the head of the School of Natural Sciences at the University of Limerick. He has an international reputation for his work on computational and statistical physics and their applications, and also on astrophysics. He publishes in the top scientific journals in his field, including Nature and Physical Review Letters. He has worked with leading researchers from places such as Cambridge and the Max Plax Institute. And he has taught physics for over 25 years. He is particularly interested in science communication and making the complex accessible. He actually has taught um, introduction to physics to more than 1000 general science students, emphasizing critical thinking, problem solving and understanding. And we're delighted to welcome David this evening. So welcome, David. So thank you to our panel of judges, Rory, Mary and David, and they will be coming back between each talk to ask questions of the various contestants as we move through the evening. So we look forward to hearing you, uh, you know, put the contestants through their paces. So now we've introduced the judges, we've talked about FameLab and we're ready to start the University of Limerick Heath for 2021. And the first person who's going to talk is Alina Dubovskaya. And she's going to talk to us about mission to survive space travel. So Alina is a researcher with a doctoral degree in geophysics, currently pursuing a PhD in applied mathematics. In her free time, she fantasizes about the ultimate questions of life, the universe and everything. So over to you, Alina. Have you ever dreamed about traveling the universe in a spaceship? Or imagined yourself serving on a space station with an important mission? Probably you think this only belongs in science fiction. Yes, our current technologies are far from creating such complex self-sustainable ship capable of protecting us from the hostile universe on a long space journey. Still, just for the next three minutes, imagine yourself waking up on a mysterious space station with different creatures living and working on it. Would you like to explore the station and learn about its mission? Then let me show you around. There are almost 9 million species on board and humans are given a position of power. We don't have a common language which everybody on the station can speak so the capabilities of the many of the station inhabitants still remain a mystery for us. A real gem of our ship is its life support system. It is super efficient and fully self-sustainable. No resupply or filter change has been ever needed. It is driven by chemical and physical processes working together in balance like perfect clocks, recycling everything we need for life. While the biological machines, the peculiar inhabitants of the station, process waste and deliver never-ending fresh supplies of oxygen, water and food. Still, we believe that this wonderful life support system has been damaged. We don't know how serious the damage is yet, and many of us are working hard on figuring that out. We must find ways to fix the damage urgently. But the problem is 
we don't fully understand how the life support system works. We just recently started to realize that the station inhabitants and their everyday needs are interconnected with the ship and are essential components of the life support system. It relies on us as much as we rely on it. We also don't know the real mission of the station yet, but it seems that our ship is pretty unique in the universe and so may be its mission. We can only hope to learn about it in the future, but our current mission is to keep the ship operational and its crew alive for as long as possible. Welcome aboard Spaceship Earth! Okay, thank you so much for that really interesting talk. So I'm now going to hand over to the judges to ask questions for a few minutes. So Ronan, maybe if you could start, please. So thanks, Alina, for a really interesting presentation and, and an interesting take on, on um, I guess, climate change and some of the challenges that the planet is facing. Um, I guess from your opinion, what's the, what's the biggest challenge that we're currently facing on, on planet Earth? And, and how potentially will we go about solving that? Uh, so I think the biggest challenge, like there are many challenges, let's say, and the biggest challenge of it is that they all, all are interconnected. That's um, what I was trying to, to tell with my story, that there is some problems which we may think they are local. They're not as local. They can trigger a very global effect, undesirable effect. And I think the current challenge is to understand how interconnected they are and to create some framework which we can use to think of a planet as a single system because it's super complex. Um, and how to connect all these dots, all these problems we see all around our planet and environment, how to connect them together and to understand how they can affect each other. Okay, and Mary, have you any question? I suppose, Alina, I thoroughly enjoyed your, your talk. Thank you. Um, what, what would you think is the key takeaway message you would like people to take from your talk this evening? I, I hope people can take the idea that we are not a passengers or a host or a guest in this planet. We are its crew and we're not only living here, we in some way are working here and serving to this station. So we need to change our mindset and to start understanding that there is nothing uh, like infinite resources or um, um, any our step can ha has consequences and we are responsible for it and for our uh, ship, which we are serving on. You really throw responsibility back at us, Alina. <laughs> so David, sorry, sorry no, that. I think it's important. So David, do you want to just give a final quick question, please? Yeah, so, um, so I really enjoyed it as well, Ed, uh, your, your talk. Um, so you're talking about a system which is interconnected. How do you think um, a system like that uh, adapts? Do you, do you think a system like that can adapt to the current changes? Uh, that's, that's a really good question. And I think, yes, of course, it can adapt. And I think that's one of the um, strengths of our planet, that it's very adaptive. And um, it is adapting to our activities, let's say, everything we do. On planet, but the question is to what extent it can adapt. So we have some level of safety where we can do things we like and enjoy and we think they're good for our civilization, but we need to be very conscious about the borders, to what extent we can change our environment, but where we have to stop. So this is a big, so my answer is that yes, Absolutely, this system is very adaptive and it will adapt and it is adapting. But we don't, we, we have to understand that there is a boundary, there is a level of how much it can adapt. Uh, if we cross this boundary, we can see an um, undesirable, catastrophic changes in our environment and we don't want to see it. 
Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks, Alina, Ronan, Mary and David. And we will move on to the next talk. Thank you so much for your thank very you. good questions. So thanks to Alina for that excellent presentation. And we now move on to our second speaker. Our second speaker this evening is Bram Siebert. He is a PhD student at the University of Limerick studying complex systems. He has applied to FameLab to learn how to explain his PhD in three minutes, to improve his communication skills, and to learn how to distill complicated topics into their essence. And this evening, Bram will talk to us about modeling of happiness. Good luck, Bram. I have a friend who's always really cheerful and optimistic. Whenever I go for coffee with him, I spend the rest of the day feeling uplifted. It turns out that that's not a coincidence. Happiness can spread. Scientifically, we could say that happiness is a contagion. And while we don't always know how a contagion spreads between two people, we do know how it spreads through a population. It spreads through your social network. Now, I don't mean Facebook or Twitter. I mean the people that you talk to day in, day out. Now, I'm a mathematician, so I wanted to write down some equations to predict how a contagion might spread through a network. It turns out that's not so easy. Sure, there's these things called mastery equations. And while they'll give you a perfect answer, very quickly, you'll have more equations than there's atoms in the universe. So you'll never be able to solve them. On the other hand, you've got these approximation methods. And what they do is they kind of lump everybody into this sort of blob. So that when you're making predictions about one person, you look at how they're related to this average mean blob. So while that's really fast, doesn't really work very well. It doesn't give very good predictions. So that's where I come in. I wanted to use two pieces of information. I wanted to take the average of the people that you're connected to and the one person that you're closest to. And I used those two pieces of information to make my predictions. And it turns out that you can make really good predictions that way and you can get them in seconds. But how do you balance these two pieces of information? Well, that's my favorite part. It turns out that you balance them equally. The one person that you're closest to is just as important as every other person combined. So if you wanna make sure that you're happy, then make sure that the person you're closest to is happy too. Thank you, Bram. Another one of the contestants putting it up to us. So we have to go in now and make sure that everybody's happy around us. So well done. So Bram, I, I really enjoyed that. It's a very, very interesting take on uh, the spread of uh, contagion, such as happiness. Can, can you tell me, um, how would you assess your model to see if it was working or not? How do you, how do you compare your prediction with reality? Sure. So, um, what we have is we use numerical simulations. That's how we can test our uh, approximations. Uh, and they, the problem with those is they can take days to run, uh, although they will be statistically exact. Uh, ultimately, how do you compare your, comparing your model to reality is much more of a challenge. Uh, there are some longitudinal studies out there, um, but that's still sort of remains a little bit of uh, a challenge for me. How do you measure happiness? The, how do you measure happiness? You ask people, are they happy? Or ask them to put it onto a scale. Uh, okay. But that's also, <laughs> yeah, a challenging one. So I'm going to get Ronan to come in next. Hey, so thanks, thanks very much, Brian, for your, for your um, presentation. I guess my question relates to, so again, I understand maybe a little bit about modeling. Um, 
does so you're, you're suggesting that it's, it's mostly internal or sorry external factors that are affecting somebody's happiness but is there a, a feedback in your model so if you, you suggested that if you keep the person closest to you happy that as long as they're happy then maybe you're happy so does does the model take that into account um it doesn't quite work like that almost um what the the i guess the, the take-home message really is that the person that you're closest to is critical but they're not everything um there's there's a balance there uh so you can't if everyone around you is negative except the one person closest to you then you're probably not going to be the happiest person uh, and if it's the other way around you're probably also have a little bit of a tough time so it's really about trying to find the balance. Sure. Okay. Thank you for a great question. And Mary, have you got a question for Bram? Yeah, Bram, thank you. I enjoyed it so much. Um, can you tell me um, uh, your style and your topic? Um, what sort of a, uh, uh, why do you think the approach you've taken now kind of appeals to people? Um, or maybe not so happy people? Do you think you could... Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand the questions and how can this help to guide us? Yes. Um, yeah, just your style and your approach that you're, you're adopting just at the moment. Um, I, I guess the important message is to try and surround, is to realize that, that happiness and positive can spread. So try to surround yourself with as many happy and positive people as you can. Obviously, you know, not everyone is going to be happy all the time, right? That's just, just natural. But be aware then as well that you kind of being a bit of a happy, cheerful person can have a knock-on effect as well. And I think mm -hmm. that's a really positive take-home story. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay, so thanks to Bram and the judges. And again, I suppose maybe we should just sing a few songs and tell a few jokes and we'll all be happy. <laughs> so... I uh, want to move on now to our uh, third contestant, who is Manif Al-Shamari. Manif is a PhD candidate at LIRO, the Science Foundation Ireland Research Centre for Software, and at the University of Limerick. His research focuses on software engineering issues and intellectual and developmental disabilities. So Manif has given me the title of his talk as Intellectual Disability and Digital Health Technology. So over to Manif. Intellectual development, disability and health, uh, digital health technology between reality and inspiration. Do you know people with IDD uh, don't use and access uh, internet as ordinary people use and access? Do you know uh, uh, people with IDD uh, um, affect about 1% of our population. Do you know uh, people with IDD struggle with some of health condition such as diabetes, uh, uh, obesity, and this one can be preventable? Uh, so uh, I have conducted a literature review uh, and the literature review uh, identified some of the barriers and that's just like a starting point for me. And, and these barriers that include uh, uh, engagement, satisfaction, uh, communication between healthcare provider and people with IDD, uh, quality of healthcare service, and um, taking this one under consideration, uh, I have met uh, some of the uh, uh, of people with IDD following the approach, nothing about us without us, and that's really approach that it's 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 allow me to discover. Uh, and explore more about the, the, the real uh, barriers uh, of using ad in digital health technology. And what I have found really interesting that that's people with IDD uh, like to see a video game that's dealing with, uh, with, uh, with, with health promotion, health education, cartoon movie, instead of just uh, seeing the, uh, a long test and uh, really complicated language, they really like uh, easy things and taking what I have found I have developed uh, a mobile application and my, my my mobile application I call it easy health info and this is the mobile application as you see it here that's 
uh, it was released in the uh, in, in iOS platform, Apple Store, and just as you can see here, just like it's it's a basic thing about a health puzzle and game, and some of the some of the question that's a basic question about diabetes, about obesity, about the temperature, and uh, uh, some inserting some some picture and some video, and this one I have sent the link and used by some of the uh, people with IDD, I have received really valuable feedback that, uh, that digital health technology can be used and can be accessible and can be understandable by, by people with IDD if we are following some, uh, some of the guidelines, some of the things that, that make uh, our uh, product uh, uh, like easy accessible by, by them. And thank you. So, thank you, Manif. And Mary, will you start the questioning this time, please? Manif, thank you very much. It was a lovely presentation. I was really impressed um, with your um, prop, your app there that you were showing us. Um, have you tried and tested that with some people? Is the feedback very positive? Yeah, that's that's a, that's a really good question. That uh, my app was released in last December, actually, and based on the on the on the feedback and the the, the, the comment uh, that's left by user, uh, it's, it's uh, as I said, this is just the, the first version of of, of my app, and uh, actually all. All of the app that's uh, all the, the the feedback and the comments uh, it's really was positive. That's uh, some of them they are saying this is this easy and simple thing about mm -hmm. uh, about the things that about about health education and health question that that address uh, some 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 health issue. Okay, thank you, Benif, and that's really good to hear. So, David, do you want to come in next? Yeah, it's a it's a very important. Um, issue and cause and uh, a very worthwhile project and um, can you tell me a little bit more about the app what what exactly how does the app work or, or how is it tailored in such a way for people with idd that uh, that it improves their interaction yeah this is this is as i said this is the this is my first version of the uh, of, of my apps and uh, i'm i'm planning to uh, to update it and to release the next version Based on the and the and the based on the design recommendation that left by user, and this is just like uh, uh, this is just one phase from multiple phases in my project. Uh, I have I have uh, I have uh, extract some design recommendation from literature or from from mobile from uh, existing mobile application and. The, taking some taking all of these recommendation and implement. Uh, uh, some of the recommendation in my in my easy health info, and uh, as I said, this is just like the first version, and it was released. And uh, uh, because what I have found really interesting about user uh, with IDD, that's really like to see a, a video game or a cartoon movie that addressing some of the information, and that's what in that's what I put actually in my in my application in my mobile app. Uh, to let uh, user to see it and to uh, interact with it. So, so you made a visual interaction, something that, yeah. that would be appealing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and Ronan. Hey, uh, thanks very much for your presentation. I guess my last question is: I, at the moment, the app is maybe aimed at, at health awareness. Am I right in that? Maybe making people aware of their people with IDD aware of certain health conditions. Can it also be used maybe in the future for diagnostics purposes? Uh, yeah, actually, when 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 I met uh, when I met, uh, when I met people with IDD, that I have really like uh, when I asked a question regarding where did you get health information, uh, I was shocked that uh, they are they are taking some of the information from none of them. They are using the uh, the, the the digital health technology like. Uh, mobile health, uh, mobile health information, or any 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 health information system application, and and taking some some 
uh, some like uh, health issue and health education and implement them in my in my application. And in the future, yeah, we might like uh, uh, because this is just like uh, this is my first step that we would like to uh, like increase the uh, the, the health uh, health awareness, health education because uh, people with ID really struggle with with the uh, with obesity and and diabetes, and that's that that that's what I put first. Later on, yeah, we might consider that uh, uh, diagnosis and for other 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 health uh, issues. Thank you for asking. That. Thank you. Okay, thanks to everybody. Thanks to Manif and the judges there. So at this point, we will move on to uh, Walter Stanley, and. Walter has over 25 years experience specifically in the area of manufacturing processes, composite materials and mechanical characterization of engineering materials, recycling of polymers, fibers and composites. So when Walter this evening is going to talk to us about ProBot producing composites from plastic bottles. Over to you, Walter. Hello, I'm going to talk to you today about plastics and plastics recycling, because that is critical. Eight million tonnes of plastic winds up now in our rivers and our oceans every year, which is detrimental to marine life. But plastic is not that the enemy, because plastic bottles are useful in many situations around the world, when there's a natural disaster and we need to get safe drinking water to people to save their lives. But also many countries don't have the luxury of just turning on a tap and drinking fresh, clean water from the tap. Many people around the world, unfortunately, their water system is not good enough. So they need to drink fresh water from a bottle. So what we've done is we've taken these bottles go to a recycling plant they crush it up into small little flakes and then we took those flakes and we made beads little plastic beads and from those beads we can then make a fiber so here is a fiber made out of that recycled plastic material but the beauty about this fiber and it's about the diameter of a human hair but the middle of it is made of a strong um, fiber, but the outer, outside of it is coated in a lower melting point plastic, but it's still the same plastic. We've just changed a little bit of the mad chemistry around it. And then when we take the, those fibers, we can weave them into a cloth or a textile type of structure like this. Again, it doesn't have any properties because it's like a piece of material. But when we heat that up again, and we put it into a press, and we press them together, we now make a structural material like this, that is very, very lightweight, but very, very strong. And this is called a, a fiber reinforced composite. Now, you might recognize composites from, if you're a follower or a fan of Formula One cars, all of the monocoque, the structure is made out of carbon fiber reinforced plastics. This is made out of uh, PET, that's the type of plastic in our bottles, uh, composite. Uh, so these, I would say, will be used in, in Formula One cars. They're just not strong enough, but they could be used in the structural design of electric vehicle cars into the future. But at the end of the day, this, because it's made out of the original bottle material, can be recycled 100% back into those flakes again and then reused. Thank you, Walter. So we're about to just hand over to the judges for some questions. And Mary, I'm going to start with you again. Walter, thank you very much. That's a really impressive presentation. Um, I'm, I'm, I had to write down because the terminology is, is new to me. Fiber reinforced composite. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm a simple engineer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Um, I, 
I was really impressed with that. It looked like a tile, what you, you know, the, the hard um, final product, I suppose. Um, where else would you see that being used? I, I know you spoke about uh, racing cars, etc. But in yeah. terms of domestic usage. Oh, yeah. Um, our, our, the, the, the commercial product uh, at the moment, uh, if you go into, which I'm very loath to go into, um, do you know if you go into Brown Thomas and you find the very expensive Samsonite luggage cases, Yes. They're made out of Samsonite, which is made mm -hmm. out of polypropylene uh, from a company called Curve. And so you can buy one of those for between 350 and 700 euros. Um, but they're using virgin plastic. So that's, what, that's one. The other is sports equipment. And the other would be uh, tractor uh, parts, you know, the side fenders. I'm yes. not. A, I'm, I'm not a farmer myself, but um, the side fenders of of of, 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 of a tractor and things <laughs> like that, and also very very much would be the the covers for an iPad. Do you know those covers that you put the iPad into? I do. Yeah. And especially in the aviation industry, where I've never travelled uh, in one, but in first class you get one of these thingies where you're, it's your own personal <laughs> type of thing. But, uh, I'll have to take your word for that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've never, I've never, I've got upgraded once into luxury economy or something like that. Yeah. But no, yeah. You, you know, you give them one of those. So I'm, I'm just saying that if you have the recycled badge on it, I think it might be a, a very good selling point, especially for um, Apple and people like that. Okay. Well Thank done, you. Mary. You got Walter talking anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, you're fine. You're fine. That's but okay. I do want to give David a minute to ask questions. Oh, so David. please, God, the, the, fi the final chaser. Yes. <laughs> hey, Walter, so I, I enjoyed the talk and I love the demos and the props and so on. And um, have you got any idea about, so you, you mentioned virgin plastic. So if you were to make a product like your composite, just yeah. from, from, just from, raw materials as opposed to recycled materials. Yep. What, what's the difference in terms of cost or energy cost that, or carbon that's, footprint? That's, that's, a, that's a fantastic uh, question. Obviously, Dave, that the carbon footprint is higher from virgin, but the cost at the moment it depends on oil production and oil uh, requirements around the world, but they're on a par at the moment. So it doesn't make, it, it, it's crazy, isn't it? It doesn't make sense to recycle uh, to recycle PET from bottles as opposed to making virgin. So that's why if you have a higher value added product, then, or else I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a sociologist. I'm not a politician or anything like that, but surely there must be a premium put on using virgin. But for the recyclers around the, the country, like a small, great company like Shabra, they find it hard to recycle, and so they can put more virgin PET as a percentage of the final product. I that's think a great, premium, that's a great country. The premium for, for using recycled. I think people will be willing to probably pay a little bit extra, it's my guess. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, I think so, Dave, because I think the young people, especially around the world, have joined this wave uh, to give a bit more impetus to us. Yeah. Maybe, so, maybe, maybe I'm a dreamer. Okay, I'm so not the only one. That's a that's a conversation for when we meet up later after Fame Lab. So I'm going to thanks say thank you to Walter and to the judges. And at this point, I'm going to welcome our final speaker of the evening, who is Mariana Silva. And Mariana was born in Portugal has always been a science enthusiast, enjoying topics from physics to archeology. span She has received her MSc degree in biomedical engineering from the University of Coimbra, Coimbra in 2018, and is currently enrolled in a Maria Sladovska Curie PhD degree that combines academia and industry. And this evening, Mariana is going to talk to us about the promise of long acting injectable. Mariana, looking forward to your talk.
Hi, tonight I'm here to talk to you about Clara. Clara is a friend of mine that has schizophrenia, a psychological disorder. So Clara, to keep her disease under control, has to take a daily pill for the rest of her life. Sometimes when Clara wakes up in the morning, she forgets to take the pill. Sometimes she takes and sometimes she doesn't. When she doesn't take, she feels awesome. She feels like herself. She feels great. She goes to work and she does an amazing work. And she comes home super happy. So then for the next couple of days, she just forgets or she doesn't take the pill because she's feeling so much like herself. And she feels so happy that she doesn't care about the pills anymore. One day at the middle of the night, I wake up to Clara singing at the edge of the window, almost killing herself. She is then admitted into the hospital where she has to take meds to recover from the episode of schizophrenia that she just said. But this time, the doctor says to Clara, Clara, I know that you are tired of taking the pill every day. I know that you are tired of having this disease and that you are tired of knowing that you will have this disease until the end of your life. But the good thing is that now we have long-acting injectables. So instead of you taking your daily pill, you get this injectable. And this injectable is composed of small crystals, which size is comparable to the size of a tennis ball when compared to the size of the earth. And this, the, because they are of this small size, they have a release profile that lasts for six months. So for six months, you are neither reminded of your disease or that you have to take a pill every day to control it. Clara is one of the 20 million people all over the world that has this disease. 69% of these people don't have access to proper health care. And of these 69%, 90% are from low and middle income countries. So with this project of developing long acting injectables, we are not only giving an answer for the people that have chronic diseases and infectious diseases that need to take a pill every day for the rest of their lives, but also to people from low and middle income countries that don't have access to proper health care and long acting injectables are a good answer because they require less resources. So by using long acting injectables, we can improve patient's life all over the world, no matter where you live. So thank you so much. Have a nice evening. So thanks to Mariana for that talk. And again, we will bring back in the judges to ask Mariana some questions. And we will ask Ronan to start off the questioning this time. Uh, thanks for a great presentation, Mariana. Very, very interesting and, and compelling, I guess. Um, I guess my question is, um, is so you, you gave one particular scenario where this, this injectable can be used, but is it transferable to other types of illnesses and other types of situations? Uh, so thanks for your question. That's actually what I'm trying to do with my project. So uh, there are already uh, long-acting injectables for, uh, for some types of diseases. So chronic diseases, so people that have uh, um, uh, long uh, chronic disease and also for um, contraception or contraceptional use that you take the pill every day to make sure that you uh, don't get pregnant. Uh, so this can be of various use. So it's not only for uh, schizophrenia. Actually, this was the first disease to which they apply this concept because it's quite difficult for ke uh, people keep uh, complying to the doctor prescription. But then they started thinking, okay, which other diseases require that people take a daily pill every day and we can use the same drug and try to get a dissolution profile that lasts for longer. So actually, uh, 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 currently there are a lot of uh, long acting injectables being developed actually uh, there was uh, one that was recently released for HIV and also there are others for TB. So we are also focusing in, in injectables for these diseases that are for low and middle income countries. And as I said, the healthcare system is not well built. Uh, sometimes they don't even have a, a healthcare system. And this is a, a, a good way of proportionate them to 
be healthy, uh, according to possible, while they have their disease under control. So also some uh, for cancer treatment that you know that for a certain period of time, usually five years, people will have to go under medication um, for this time. And you can assure that by long acting injectables. But the problem uh, currently in industry is that uh, the method to produce these long acting injectables um, uses the top down approach. So you start from bigger particles and then you uh, try to achieve these smaller particles. Uh, but there is a lot of metal contamination and that might uh, increase uh, some issues and some uh, further uh, diseases in the people that take them. Okay, uh, of course, so there are always. I sorry. Ariana, no, you're okay. You're okay. But we just need to have time to move over to the other. Uh, so sorry. So, so sorry. Yeah, you're okay. Yeah. So the last question of the evening goes to Mary. Thank you, Isa. Mariana, I'm really, really impressed with that and I'm very interested in it. Um, because it, it is very difficult for such patients to, to keep, uh, you know, putting on timers and reminding themselves to take the medication, et cetera, et cetera, from what I understand from listening to people talking. How is this administered? What you propose is it come in a pen like, uh, or, or, you know, do you know the way um, diabetics have to diabetics. inject? Diabetics, yeah. Or so, is, it, is it a candela that's inserted? And, you know, but maybe that's, I know cancer patients that have had that ongoing type of treatment. So is it is it going to be in an easy format? Okay, so right now what, uh, uh, what is done is people go to the hospital from time to time and they get like a vaccine. So it's injected in your, uh, in your, into, into you. So you need a medical practitioner to do that. Of course, we are also trying to work other ways to administer, administer so to make it even more easier. The thing is that you also need to have a control of the disease. So you need to know if a patient is reacting well to the dose that yes. is receiving, if it needs to be adjusted. So during the, f the, the first, uh, months of taking the medicine, people mm -hmm. have to go to the, uh, the doctor. So from time to time just to make sure that the uh, the blood concentration of the drug is there but of mm -hmm. course when uh, long acting injectables are more settled then uh, we will go to other ways of uh, giving the medicine but the thing is that you still have the problem of compliance because people still have to inject themselves and you have to make sure that they are reminded of injecting themselves at that certain day mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that they don't relapse so I don't think that uh, that is a really big problem in all the in all the pharmaceuticals. It's people compliance because it's a people's choice. And of course, you, we cannot force people to take anything, but mm -hmm. we are just trying to make it more easier for people that have these diseases and have live with these diseases because there is no cure mm -hmm. uh, to okay. to have the disease under control. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Lovely. So thank you so much, Mariana, for that very interesting talk and that lovely discussion afterwards. So at this point, I want to thank all of the people who took part. But uh, at, it is now for the judges to actually leave and to go to a breakout room. So they have about 10 or 15 minutes to decide who will go through to the FameLab Ireland 2021 final. So we're going to have a winner and someone in second place, and they're heading off to a breakout room to do this. So I'm sure uh, Mary, Ronan and David, you will have some very interesting discussion. So we wish you the best of luck with those, uh, those uh, deliberations, and we'll see you in a little while. So before that, for the audience, so the people who are here listening to us this evening, we have an important task for you. We actually also gave, as well as the judge prize, we also gave an audience prize. So you will see now a slide with the web address, famelab2021.com. So we want you to go onto this site on your phone or laptop and select your favorite talk. One vote for one talk only, please. So before you make that final decision, I'm just going to very briefly remind you about the five talks. So our first talk was Alina, who spoke about mission to survive space travel. Bram spoke to us about the modeling of happiness. Manif 
talked about intellectual disability and digital health technology. Walter presented robot producing composites from plastic bottles. And finally, we had a talk from Mariana on the promise of long acting injectable. So uh, if you can please go into and uh, famelab2021.com and make your vote. The winner of this vote will be announced in the Facebook live stream comments section. So while we're waiting for the judging panel to return with the results, we're going to enjoy a little trip down Famelamp Ireland memory lane. As mentioned earlier, this is the final year of Famelab Ireland. And we wanted to relive some of the best interval acts of the past Ireland national finals. In 2017, international award-winning science communicator, Cater, and a double Irish radio award-winning BBC presenter, Eamon Maguire, took us on what she herself called the journey of madness, fascinating, musical, and scientifically sound exploration of how humans and other animals fall in love. Sit back, relax, and get ready for some feel-good musical comedy with a factual twist. I am Eamon McGuire, and I like to talk about science that's in the everyday, science that all of us can relate to. In particular, I love to talk about sexy science. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I know what people usually think whenever I say that. People say, sexy science, does that really work? Do those two words really go together? Well, hopefully by the end of this talk, I can convince you that they do. Put up your hand if you've ever been in love. Most people are really awkward. There's a couple over there, one hand up, one hand down. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed for you. Um, so Vincent van Gogh once said that love is a mystery in a mystery. And I find that absolutely captivating and so romantic. And I wanted to find out what exactly was love. Could we pin it down? So I started asking people what love meant to them. Not many people could give me an answer. Um, my sister said, love is completeness. Um, I nearly vomited. And uh, <laughs> my best friend probably came up with the best answer. She said, love is almost like a socially acceptable form of insanity, a beautiful madness, and I kind of melted. Um, and I just thought that was absolutely lovely. And I am not the only person who's wanted to know this answer, because the most Googled question in 2012 was what is love. And I was hearing everyone's explanations, and they were all very romantic, and they were all very, very idealistic, but I wanted science, and I wanted facts. And through my exploration, I discovered that science splits love into three distinct stages. So join me on this journey of madness. We begin at stage one, lust. At puberty, two sex hormones become active in the body. We've got our estrogen and our testosterone. And from then on in, we are constantly on the prowl for someone to reproduce with. But how do we entice them? We flirt. Some of us better than others. <laughs> if you want to flirt with someone, make your first line a good one. Do not use my favorite one. People think you're calling them fat. <laughs> It takes your brain less than a second to decide if you're going to fancy someone or not. That is why the first chat up line is so, so important. And fear not for the less attract attractive amongst us, many in this room. Studies show, <laughs> <laughs> studies show that good flirting technique is actually more important than good looks. Thank God. So that is, that's, a real, that's a really good thing to take away from science, that you don't actually have to be that hot. You just have to pretend that you are. Animals aren't quite so tactful, like us, with unrequited lust. Take, for example, the male wolf spider. <laughs> if a male wolf spider approaches an unwilling female, she does not simply retreat. She eats him. <laughs> so don't feel too bad next time you're rejected, because seriously, it could be worse. Now, once we're on my favorite topic, which is animals mating, um, I'm going to share a song with you that, of course, I've written about this topic. Um, and the song is about the fact that most people think that animals just meet and mate. 
They don't take into consideration that they might actually fall in love like us humans. But this song is told from the point of view of two lustful animals who have recently, it sounds weirder uh, now when I say it out loud, who have recently met and fell, uh, instead of falling madly in love, they decide to just meet and mate. And they decide to give their opinion on the human dating scene. This is an animal love song. I'd never seen such a handsome beaver <laughs> You caught my eye with your healthy signs And your toothy smile I could tell that you were eager So I walked right up And I sniffed your foot And you smelled just like a tree I knew you were the one for me And you must have had a sexy mind Because you sniffed me from behind But this isn't art It's not seduction It's just simple reproduction he said, well, I could say I love you, but I'm just following evolutionary trends. She said, well, I could say that I need you, but I just need you till this time of ovulation ends. But, 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 beaver love, my beaver love. After I'd written this song, I played it for my mom on FaceTime. And she said, please never, ever, ever play that song in public. <laughs> and I was like, Mom, of course I won't. <laughs> then as we were mating, we saw two humans dating. They were kissing, holding hands, but both of them were wearing pants. And I could tell they were of age for fertilization of eggs. So why are they wasting all their time with dinner, nice kisses and wine? When they should be at it like the rabbits They should rattle like the snakes Clean each other just like cats Or use no hands like a T-Rex They should be swinging like the monkeys Squealing like the pigs Or just doing it like us beavers On these leaves and worms and twigs <laughs> So humans next time just say hey I like your DNA Do you wanna set a date To come over and procreate? <laughs> he said, well, I could say I love you But I'm just following evolutionary trends She said, well, I could say that I need you But I just need you till this time of ovulation ends But, 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 people love I know everybody knows the tune this time, so I'm going to keep saying it Everybody sing along, please But, but, but Now that we know that we are humans and we do actually fall in love with people, we need to think, what are we attracted to? Or in other words, who are we going to flirt with? So one of the things that we find really, really attractive is the color red. Millions of years ago, our ancestors developed this ability to see ripe red fruits amongst green leaves. And from then on in, red equaled reward. Now, we've got things like Coke and McDonald's trying to make themselves more appealing by being red. And even looking at someone wearing red can quicken the pulse and cause mass feelings of excitement. Calm down, guys. <laughs> Our lips evolved to become red to attract mates. In fact, men consistently rate women with plumper, redder lips as more attractive, which is why women will wear red lipstick and why men want us all to look like Angelina Jolie. There have been a few experiments looking at the impact of red on men in particular. One study in 2008, men openly said, yeah, if she's wearing red, I'll spend more money on her. And another study in 2012, men were shown to spend more money on dates whenever the waitresses were red and provide those waitresses with more tips than the waitresses who were wearing white. 
Another thing that can really spark our interest in someone is their scent. And I don't mean perfume scent, aftershave, body odor. I mean their natural scent. So we have got a group of genes called the MHC genes. And they control our immune system, and they also give us our natural scent. In a famous experiment, women overwhelmingly preferred the smell of T-shirts worn by men with different MHC genes to their own. Why would that happen? Well, if two people with different MHC genes and therefore different immune systems come together to produce a child, the child's immune system will have the best of both worlds, so it can better fight disease. So in terms of genetics, opposites really do attract. So now we've flirted our way and fancied our way through stage one, the best stage. And we are now complete with stage one, and we can move together to stage two, romantic attraction. This is the stage where you're head over heels, madly in love with someone, you can't get enough of them. Um, you resort to stalking <coughs> on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. You just think that you're the modern day Romeo and Juliet, and no one will ever be in, as in love as the both of you. Yeah, see? <laughs> that baby is like, yep. <laughs> um, never been heckled by a baby before. <laughs> People usually associate uh, love with the heart, but the real magic does happen in the brain. And there are several areas of the brain that were shown by scientists on an MRI to light up when people were madly in love. The, the first was an area called the caudate nucleus. So it helps us expect and detect rewards. Another area was something called the ventral tegmental area. And it acts nearly like a chemical making factory, and it shoots these little arrows laced with love drugs all through your vulnerable brains. These love drugs are serotonin blockers, adrenaline, dopamine, and oxytocin, and they can actually give us a natural high. They stimulate the same area of the brain as cocaine with similar side effects, like increased heart rate, obsessive thoughts, and ultimately, addiction. Put simply, we are chemically insane. Now, we humans aren't the only ones to suffer from these side effects. Some animals can feel them as well. <laughs> um, for example, if we look at seals, if we take the male seal, when a male seal is trying to woo a female seal, <laughs> when a male tra seal is trying to woo a female seal, he will lose over half his entire body weight just with the sheer effort. I wish that happened to me. <laughs> I was trying to wait people. Um, this, a similar type thing happens with elephants, and it's again, it's the males. Whenever a male elephant is in the middle of elephant mating season, he gets so thin, frail, and exhausted from all the elephant relations that he has to go back to his herd for months just to recuperate and to get his strength back. So that is our stage two complete. Your brain cannot survive in a kind of blissful, drugged up state forever. It eventually has to sober up. So that sobering up takes us to stage three, attachment. And this is the point where you are in this relationship for the long haul. And your brain responds with a rush of something called oxytocin, which is the love hormone. It acts like the glue in a long-term relationship, keeping you together with that person long enough, scientifically, hopefully, to raise a family. And that's the happily ever after. As we all know, nothing ever goes wrong with relationships. <laughs> Ideally, your journey should end there, and you should kind of drive off into the sunset in your family Volvo with your 2.4 kids in the back. But that doesn't always happen. You know, we've got things like people who cheat on people, touchy subject. We've got relationship breakdown. We've got um, things like divorces. Um, and the scientific stages of love, one, two, three, it doesn't always happen that way. Some people are just really motivated by the lust stage, and they don't want to move on to stage three attachment. Some people get so addicted to that cocaine-like high of stage two that they want to experience that over and over again. You can't really experience that over and over again with the same person. But if you break up with that person and start a relationship with a new person, then start a relationship with a new person and keep going. The people who change their Facebook relationship statuses all the time, we would call them stage two junkies. They need that cocaine-like high. 
Um, and it's not their fault, it's just chemicals. Um, and people can actually experience all three stages at the same time with different people. So you could be married and in a long-term relationship, which is stage three, attachment. At the same time, you could have a bit of a thing for someone at work and they really make your heart beat and they make your tummy feel funny, which is stage two, romantic attraction. But you might really lust after someone who gets the bus home with you. So you can experience all of them at the same time. The reason that everyone doesn't go through them in the same way is just because we're human and love is as diverse as the people who experience it. Now, after going through all that and talking about all the science of love, I feel like we're kind of close enough for me to share a little personal story about my experience, or lack of, with, <laughs> with love and with relationships. I kind of consider myself to be you know, one, one of the lucky ones because I have actually met my soulmate. Oh. <laughs> and I have experienced love. Um, back home in Belfast, uh, we've got this really cute little kind of coffee shop. You probably don't have it here. It's called Starbucks. And, <laughs> and I actually fell madly in love with a barista in Starbucks. We had this whole thing going, you know, this whole chemistry, and we had our own personal jokes. You know, I would pay for my tea and they would spell my name wrong, and it was obviously so I would have to go up and get another one. So cute. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, the feeling wasn't mutual um, because they were married. Um, but like all good relationships, you know, we both got things from it. I got this song um, and a restraining order. So <laughs> I am going to finish my talk today, and thank you all so much for listening, with my scientifically accurate love song. So it's welcome back after that. One of the difficulties with being a judge or the disappointments maybe is that you actually miss most of the interval act. So we were all having very good fun with uh, 
while that was going on. And I hope you, the audience, enjoyed it as much. So before we go to the results, I uh, am I welcoming David to give an overall view of what the judges have just sort of an overall view of what she thought of the evening, maybe, David. You're the one who's on my screen, so you get the question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ronan uh, was supposed to do it, but... Oh, I got, sorry. <laughs> I think... Um, uh, so I'd, my background is I'm a physicist, and uh, there's a very famous physicist called Richard Feynman, won the Nobel Prize, and... Um, Richard Feynman always used to say that if you really understand your subject, if you really want to, to understand something, you, you have to be able to explain it in layman terms. And, um, and I think we saw really good examples of that this evening. I think everybody here is to be congratulated in terms of the effort that they put in, the, the great imagination that they've showed, um, really some very um, worthwhile uh, um, subjects as well from from everything from from global climate change um, uh, to to uh, recycling to um, to the spread of happiness which is a wonderful concept uh, um, uh, right down to the to the very last speaker and uh, it, it was I think uh, it was a tour de force from all of the speakers and they should all be very proud of themselves uh, it's not an easy thing to get up and to speak um, in front of a, a bunch of people um, that, that you're, you're not familiar with, um, who are essentially um, your peers. Um, and uh, I think you all did an exceptional job. And so thank you all um, and congratulations to you all and be, be proud of what you've achieved uh, this evening. Um, all three of the judges here really enjoyed your talks and, um, and uh, I, I, I can say that hand on heart. It was a, it was a great experience this evening. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so thanks for that, David. Ronan, sorry, seeing as I stole your thunder, do you want to say anything? No, I think, I think, Dave, I think <laughs> David has really expressed it. it very well there. So I, okay. I'm glad he actually <laughs> walked out the way he did. I'm glad. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I am going to ask Mary because Mary is the one person of the three judges who comes from a totally non-science engineering background. So Mary, do you want to make a comment about what you heard? Yeah, I was seriously impressed, Ita, because coming in tonight, I said, oh, good Lord, am I going to learn anything here? And uh, I did. I've learned an awful, awful lot. And I've been so impressed with the work that's taking place and uh, the research that's going on and the delivery, how all of this is being delivered to people like me of a non-science background. Just mm -hmm. congratulate everybody. A fascinating presentation from everybody. Time, effort and just the skill in pre presenting. Um, uh, you know, what they have researched, what they have found, what they're working on in a very clear, coherent way. And I thank all of the people who presented. Really, really impressive stuff. OK, so thanks to the judges. So I think we'll give the judges a clap before we get any, uh, any results, which I have sitting here on my phone. So without any further ado, it uh, is my great pleasure to announce the second and first places for this evening. and. Both uh, people will be going through to the FameLab Ireland competition. So uh, thanks to everybody for taking part. And in second place, we have Walter Stanley. So congratulations to Walter. <laughs> okay, so... Here we have Walter looking a little bit stunned. So well done, Walter. You better mind those props for the next day. Congratulations. Okay. And therefore, the announcement of the winner of tonight's uh, heat is Mariana Silva. So congratulations to Mariana. So Can I talk? Thank you. Two words. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. <laughs> the That's good. Yeah, well done. Congratulations. So congratulations to everybody for taking part. Um, I suppose just to, to finalise, to, to wrap up, obviously we absolutely have to thank our contestants, Alina, Bram, Manif, Walter and Mariana. And we wish Walter and Mariana the best of luck in the next round of FameLab. 
Thanks so much to Ronan, Mary and David for your time coming in to judge. And I hope you found it as enjoyable an experience. And certainly from the way you're talking, you did as I did. It's really been a marvellous night. We also want to thank the funders, SFI, CPL and Henkel, the partners, British Council Ireland, University of Limerick, News Talk and a host of others. And of course, thanks to you, the audience, for your time. We were delighted to have you here this evening. Thanks to everybody. In the norm, we would be saying, you know, safe home. Afraid that can't be for this year. But we all look forward to getting back into the university again within the next few months. So thanks to everybody. And thanks again to the British Council, to the people in Fame Lab for allowing us to have such a really good evening this evening. Good evening and thank you.